Oh, like three of you are excited to be in church this morning. Who's excited to be in church this morning? You guys, I'm just saying, last week, like Pastor Kevin said, I was not here. Uh, our family went to Wisconsin, and we got to spend a little time with our family. And last Sunday, I officiated a wedding over by Stillwater. Uh, but I have to say, I am really, 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 really excited to be back with my church family today. And so, you better buckle up, because I, if I get a week off, I come back like water being held back and just sent out. So it's going to be good, but I am excited for what uh, God wants to speak to us today. Uh, but before I get started, Pastor Kevin preached an incredible message last week in week five of our series, The Signs. And I got to watch it this last week. On Monday, I came back and I watched it online. If you don't know, we video record all of our messages every single week and we post them onto YouTube and a link is on our website and if you ever miss a week uh, I want to just encourage you go watch it online because just because you weren't able to make it to church Doesn't mean now with this incredible technology that you have to miss the word that God brings to our church So make sure you go and look at that But can we just thank pastor Kevin for preaching the word of God to us last week? It was Monday afternoon, and I was sitting in the sound booth as I watched it, and my heart was blessed by your message. So thank you so much uh, for preaching to us and speaking to us last week. Well, like we're saying, today is the sixth week of our message series called The Signs. Everybody look at your neighbor and say The Signs. And in this series, we're looking at the seven signs in the Gospel of John. That is the, the account of Jesus' life through the lens, through the perspective of the disciple named John. In his gospel, he says that he's the one that Jesus loved. Basically, he says that he's Jesus' favorite when he's telling the story. How many of you would probably do the same thing? Me too. So he writes down his account of Jesus' life, and in that account, there are seven signs that he writes down. And we've learned through this series that he wrote these signs for a very specific purpose. They weren't just, just tossed in there. He wrote them with a purpose. And it tells us that in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, our theme verse for this series. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe. Everyone say believe. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So it says that John wrote this gospel not just so that we, we would know what Jesus did, but so that we would know who Jesus is. He wrote down this gospel, this account, so that we wouldn't just know the workings he did, but we would know the identity that that points to, and that is the word Christ. Everybody look at your neighbor and say Christ. It says that, that he writes this so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And now that word Christ, maybe news to you, is not Jesus' last name. Okay, his name was not Jesus Christ. That was actually his title. A more correct like rendering or a translation of that title would be Jesus the Christ. Okay, because that's what he was. Christ is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word that translates as Messiah. Okay, so the in Old Testament, all the prophets and all of the Old Testament pointed to this Messiah that was to come. That literally means the anointed one, the chosen one, like the selected one, the set apart one. And then in the New Testament, they start writing in Greek. And so we get the word, the Christ. In Greek, it's Christos. And, and all of the Bible was pointing to this Messiah, this Christ that was going to come, that was going to be the prophet that ends all prophets, that was going to be the priest of the, the final priest of all the priests, that he was going to be king of not just a nation, but he was going to be king of the world. And his ultimate title, his ultimate job description would become savior of the world. And so John wrote down his story of Jesus' life, his account of the things he saw and he experienced. He had those things written down so that we wouldn't just know that Jesus was a man who lived about 2,000 years ago and walked the earth and did some cool things. 
He wrote it down so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we would have full life in his name. So today, we're going to study the sixth sign. The last five weeks, we covered one, two, three, four, five. It's been great. If you missed any of those messages, go on our website and watch those. But today, we're going to be in John chapter 9. If you have a Bible with you, you can open up to John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Or you can open up your Bible app, and you can click to John chapter 9. Or it will be on the screen for all of us to read together. I also want to let you know, on the back of the program you received when you walked in, we, as always, have room for you to take notes. If you really love Jesus, you can take notes on the back of that sheet of paper. No, I'm just kidding. Some of you are like, is that mandatory? No, uh, but it is encouraged. There is scientific evidence that if you take notes, you retain more information. And we don't just come just to hear some really loud guy talk for 35 minutes. We come so that we can hear the word of God and that we can leave this place changed. Amen. So we're going to look at God's word this morning in John chapter nine and a recap in chapters 7 and 8 of John. You have to know Jesus just had a major altercation with the Jewish leaders. Okay, Pastor Kevin preached about Jesus walking on the water. And then Jesus comes into Jerusalem and he goes face to face with the Pharisees and Sadducees and the Jewish leaders. If you've never read it before, you should go this week and read John chapter 7 and 8. Because I promise you, it is better than a soap opera. Okay, the drama is thick. You can cut the tension with a knife. And Jesus just escapes when all of the religious leaders start to get really mad, are about to stone him, want to kill him. And then we enter John chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And it says this, as he passed by, okay, he just literally like was about to be stoned to death. And he sneaks out. It says now Jesus passed by. It wasn't that big of a deal to Jesus. He knew God's plan. He knew the time wasn't yet that he was going to give his life. And so Jesus just passed by. He's just, he's just out on a stroll in Jerusalem. And so he passed by, and it says he saw a man blind from birth. So he sees this man blind from birth, can't see, has no sight, completely blind. And Jesus sees the man that can't see him. And it says... His disciples asked him, so his followers come up to Jesus and are like, okay, Jesus, we got a question for you. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're basically saying, okay, Jesus, this guy has an ailment. He's blind. So, so this must be a result of his sin, right? But, but was it his sin or his parents who sinned that caused this man to be given this affliction, to, to be given this burden this, this setback, this, this amount of pain in his life. They said, Jesus, whose fault was it? Because usually when we experience something like this, we think, okay, who's to blame? Okay, whose fault is it that this man is blind? Was it, was it his or was it his parents? But Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Church, this is crucial. This man's blindness was not a consequence or a punishment of his sin or his parents' sin. And this is so important because there is this unhealthy theology that some people have in Christianity that think that if you have a setback in life, maybe it's a physical ailment, maybe, maybe it's getting fired from your job, or, or maybe it's going through a really difficult financial season or, or whatever it is. We think in this unhealthy theology that it's God punishing us. See, we sometimes tend to perceive every bad thing in life as punishment or a consequence from God on our life. But that's not true. If we start to believe that, we start to see God as angry and as mean and like vengeful. And we, and we get this image of God that he's like sitting up in heaven watching us. And, and as soon as we mess up, he's saying, oh, I'm going to get him. Oh, I'm going to get that Nick. Did you see what he just did, angels? Come watch what I'm about to do. But that's not the God that we serve. Our God is good and loving. 
He's not sitting in heaven wanting to punish us. And Jesus says right here so clearly that if we have that unhealthy theology, that if something bad happens in your life or my life, that I must have done something wrong and now God is punishing me. Jesus says, don't buy into that lie. That will give you a picture of the father that doesn't align with who he actually is because he's loving and kind. And so that's why Jesus clarifies. It wasn't that this man sinned or his parents. He says this wasn't a consequence for their sin. And see, here's the truth. Here's why it gets twisted. We get this, this truth confused. And that is the truth actually is of bad things happening in our life. That all bad things are a result of sin, general but not a consequence of sin, personal. See, all bad things in our life, that be pain, sickness, disease, setback, disappointment, heartbreak, all of those things are a result of sin in general. Meaning the Bible says that when God created the earth, he created it perfect. He created Adam and Eve in the garden without sin, and therefore, there was no pain. There was no disease. There was no war. There was no famine. There was no disappointment. There was no heartbreak. It was perfect. But then Adam and Eve sinned. And thus, sin entered the world. And Romans says that sin entered the world through one man, and death came through sin. That means that all of the bad things that you've ever experienced in your life, all of the bad things I've experienced in my life are a result of sin in general. Basically, we live in a fallen and a broken world. And so before we sinned, there was no pain, there was no sickness, no disease. But now that Adam and Eve sinned, and every one of us since then are in a world full of sin and people full of sin. Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now that we live in a sinful, broken world, now we have pain and sickness. And see, if we understand that first half, it helps us see God right. Because instead of blaming God then for the pain in our life, he's not up there in heaven like personally uh, giving us consequences and punishing us for every sin in our life. It's because we sinned. Bad things happening is because of us. It's God didn't give us a broken world. We broke it. You know, I've used the illustration before that it's like a, a kid who gets a toy and they're playing with it and then they break it and then they turn to their parent and they say, why did you give me a broken toy? My four-year-old and two-and-a-half-year-old do that, okay? But that's not the case. He gave it to us perfect and working without sin, without sickness and shame and pain. But then we broke it. So all bad things in life are a result of sin in general, not personal. But here's the second half. It's not a consequence of sin personal. All bad things. And now here I want to say that all bad things are a result of sin in general, but not all bad things are a consequence of sin personal. See, because there's really three ways that we can experience a bad thing for us personally. The first is that some bad things we experience in life are a consequence of my sin personally. Okay? That's just the reality, that when we sin, there are natural negative consequences to it. All sin and death and bad things entered the world because of sin in general. But when I choose to sin, there are now in this world, this system, how things work, I now experience consequences for my sin. I'll explain it real simply. If I am a friend of yours, okay, we're, we're buddies, and I lie to you to your face, and you find out about it, there is now a consequence for my sin of lying that is mistrust, isn't there? That now the natural consequence to my sin is now that you don't trust me anymore. I've broken the trust between me and you, and our relationship is hurt. So that is an example of some bad things we can experience as a personal consequence to my sin. So some things we do are just our fault. Your parents can tell you what all of them are, okay? When you do something silly that you know you shouldn't do and you experience a consequence, that does come. 
But not all bad things are consequences. That's just one of them. The second, some bad things are an effect of someone else's sin. See, some of the bad things we experience are a result of a sin of someone else. Now that we live in a sinful, broken world, we now have to experience the consequences, the repercussions of other people doing not smart stuff. I'll give you an example. One of your good friends, they, they have your trust, you've been friends for a long time, and you hear that they gossiped about you. That they started spreading rumors about you or they told someone else something about you that wasn't true. Now they sinned, they gossiped. But now you are experiencing the pain as a result of their sin. Now you're being hurt because they spoke something against you that wasn't true. You thought you trusted them, but now you have this, this betrayal in your heart, a, a pain in your heart that isn't a result of anything you even did, but some sin someone else did. Some of the pain we experience is a result of somebody else sinning. And lastly, some bad things are just because we live in a sinful world. That some things are just because of sin general. And this is so important. Because church, we have to know that all disease and all pain and all sickness is not always a result of someone's sin personally or even someone sin close to them. I've heard stories of people who, who get sick with cancer or something, and somebody comes up to them at one time, and they start to, to talk to them and tell them that the reason you have gotten this, the reason you've experienced this, must be because of some sin in your life. What is it? And this person is crushed. But I don't, church, we cannot believe that. The book of Job is literally an entire book that goes against that entire philosophy. Job, he was righteous before God. He, he followed the law completely and it says he loved God and he followed God. He doesn't do anything wrong. And yet Satan comes and he takes away his family. He takes away his fortune. He takes away everything. And his friends come up to him and say, Job, what did you do? God must be really mad at you, literally. Your house went up in smoke. Your family is all dead. Your cattle is all gone. What did you do? Repent. And he goes before his friends and he says, I didn't do anything. God knows my heart. Because all of that happening wasn't a result of his sin personally or the sin of someone else close to him. It is just because he lives in a fallen world where now there is sin. And sin brought death and pain and heartache. Sometimes our pain in life is because of some sin we do. Like my mom, for instance. I've shared the story many times that my mom passed away from lung cancer that we didn't know that she had when she was 54 years old. I was a sophomore in college. But see, that wasn't just because of just anything in general. She had an addiction to cigarettes for like 35 years of her life. But that was just a natural consequence of her decisions. Now, is it heartbreaking? Yeah, I miss my mom every day. But I know that my mom knew Jesus and had faith in him and now she's in heaven. And today she is breathing better air than I am. But some things that happen in life are just Something we did can cause it. Sometimes the pain is because of what somebody else did. And sometimes it's just because we live in a sinful world. Some people I know of never smoked a day in their life and cancer enters into their body. There's no reason to result. Some of you, you work hard every day. You, you are faithful, you are honest, you have integrity in your job. And you lose your job because of company setbacks. It wasn't God punishing you for that. It was just because in this world there is pain now because of sin. And so church, if you ever go through something or you ever encounter someone who's going through something painful, experiencing a bad thing, experiencing a, a disease or a difficulty or a sickness, whatever it may be, just know that it's not always a result of sin personal. 
It might just be a result of living in a sinful world in general. And either way, when someone experiences something difficult, even if they're experiencing something difficult because of something they did, isn't our job to love them right where they are anyways? Because the way I read Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that means that I do dumb stuff too. And when I experience consequences for my actions and I do something silly, I have so many people in my life that just come alongside me and say, Nick, I know you're going through something right now, but it's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Because something else that I believe about Jesus, about our God, is something incredible. That verse 3, let's read it again. Jesus answered, it's not that this man sinned or his parents, okay? So not everything bad in our lives is our fault or even somebody close to us is fault. It's not a punishment from God. Some things are just a consequence of sin in general. But listen to this. Everybody say, but. But, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus said that, that even though we experience difficult things, God will still work in our life. What this shows me is that what God does, what he has been doing from the beginning, what he has done since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, is he has been working in people's lives, even though they've sinned and fallen short of his glorious standard. He has not just said, okay, out with you. He has been trying to redeem us and buy us back since the beginning. He has been working on our behalf, even when we mess up. What this shows me is that God will repurpose your pain. Everybody say that with me. God will repurpose your pain. You need to hear this because even though we go through difficult things, we need to love one another. But what we also need to encourage one another with and believe with everything we have in our hearts is that when we experience the pain of this life, whether it's because of something we did, whether it's because of something somebody else did, whether it's because of something nobody around us did, but just because there is now sin and sickness and death and famine in this world, when we experience pain, God promises that he will repurpose that pain for a purpose. He will take what is broken and he will fix things with broken things. He will take things that were messed up and he will straighten other people's path out even if we can't see it happen. Is anybody thankful for a God that repurposes pain for a new purpose? I'm so thankful for this in my life. My mom passed away when I was 20 years old. Horrific, terrible thing in my life. Hardest season I've ever gone through. But it left me with the only thing I had left was Jesus. Literally, my mom was my, any, my everything. I lived in a single family home. She was my only parent growing up. But I read a few verses right after she passed away. And I watched God work in the midst of a painful and a difficult situation. Genesis 50, verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me. Sometimes in life, the pain we experience is because somebody was just out to get us. It wasn't even what we did. It wasn't just a byproduct of a random decision they made. Sometimes they're just out to get us. But it says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. That's the story of Joseph. That his brothers were jealous of him and his coat of many colors if he grew up in church. They threw him into a well, left him for dead. Then saw a caravan, traded him into slavery. Then he goes, he rises up in Pharaoh's house. He becomes the second in command over the whole nation and his brothers come asking him for food. I don't know about you, but that would be a great opportunity for payback. But then he gives his brothers the food, even more than they asked for it. It brings them back to pulls a little break on them, but, but blesses the family. See, God took his painful situation and he used it to bring reconciliation to other people. Yes, amen. Because the verse that spoke to me the most, it's tattooed on my arm right here. Romans 8, 28. 
Because we know that in all things, everybody say all things. Say it again, all things. One more time, with everything that we experience, we need to know that all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And this is one of my favorite things about God, that he takes the broken things of our life, the things that we can't imagine how any good would come out of, and he somehow redeems it. He turns it for good. That, re that word redeem means to buy back, or it means to compensate for the bad things in. Meaning when bad things happen in our life, God takes those bad things and he turns them for good. The day my mother died was the first day that my father ever told me that he loved me. And now he has began rebuilding the relationship between me and my father. And he doesn't know Jesus. But now I pray every day that one day through a relationship with me, he would just see a little bit of Jesus and that he would come to know him as his personal savior because I believe that God uses even bad things and he turns them for good. And I speak that so strongly to you because in the midst of the bad things, you need to have a loud voice yelling at you that God will repurpose your pain. He will take whatever you experience and he'll turn it for good. He will compensate for the bad things. And it's even amazing that he takes the broken things in me to bring healing to other people. Do you know that one of the most ministering things you can do is show someone else your brokenness? I read this book one time. Well, actually, my wife read the book and I just gleaned information from her. She read this book that talked about this principle of going second. Meaning when we are in, in relationship with other people, one of the most powerful things you can do is give the gift of going second. Which means that you go first at sharing what is broken or what hurt or what damaged you in your heart. That when you open up and share how you've been broken, or how you struggle, or how you failed in places of your life, and you allow other people to hear that, you give them this beautiful gift of going second. It's way easier to share a struggle of yours when you just heard somebody share a struggle of theirs. Mm -hmm. That's why I, on this platform, never will present myself as perfect, because I'm not. My wife will tell you I'm far from it. But I celebrate, I can boast in my weaknesses because God's power is made perfect in my weakness. Meaning if I look like I have it all together, I get the glory. If I look like a hot mess that just says, thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me when I've fallen short, for using even my bad decisions to help other people, we're working through my frailty. When we do that, God gets the glory. Amen. When you guys experience difficult things, know that God will repurpose your pain. He will use it for his glory. So now let's read the rest of this story. It's going to be kind of a long section, and then I have one point at the end as I wrap up. But we have this blind man that Jesus experiences. He's not blind because of his sin, his parents. He's blind because of sin in the world. But Jesus says, he's blind so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Verse four, it continues. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Jesus made this blind man see. He, he spit on the ground and made some mud. I don't recommend doing this if you are going to pray for someone. Okay. But he did. Rubbed it on his eyes. Sends him to a pool to go wash over there. 
wants this man to be faithful. Hey, if I tell you to go over there, are you going to? He does. He comes back and he's seeing. But Jesus doesn't just do this miracle so that we can know that Jesus can make people see again when they're blind. He doesn't do this miracle just so that this blind man would see, but there is a way bigger meaning, a way bigger purpose to this miracle, which is why the Apostle John wrote it in his account. So in verse 8, the rest of the story, the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, it is not this man who used to sit and beg. Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. Then said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. Basically, this man gets healed and the people around him are like, that can't be the same man. What it shows us is that when God does something in your life, people will not believe the change that God has done in your heart. People are going to think, oh, you're just the same. You haven't been changed. Jesus hasn't done anything to you. But this man stood and said, no, Jesus has changed my life. And though you don't see it, I know the change that has taken place. So don't let other people's doubt in what Jesus has done in your life take away from your faith. Let's stand on what God has done in our heart and be confident of who he has made us to be. That though we are still sinners, he is perfecting us and making holy what he's already declared holy. People are never going to believe the change in us. But don't let that take away our faith. 13. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes, and I washed, and I see. The story gets shorter and shorter every time. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath, though. So but others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? Since he has opened your eyes. And the blind man said, he's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be the Christ, who he really was, but if they do that, he is to be put out of the synagogue. He's going to be disowned from the community. Therefore, his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. So they asked him again. For the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. He said, we know he's a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Come on, explain this to us. He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to also become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, are you his disciple? But we are the disciples of Moses. You are his disciple, but we're the disciple of Moses. We know that God had spoken to Moses, but as for this man... We do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. They said, we don't believe you. You can show us all the evidence, but we are not going to believe what Jesus did for you. We do not believe that Jesus is the Christ. We do not believe that he could make you see. We did not believe that now you do see that you were blind. They rejected everything, including who Jesus was. Yes. Because again, this story isn't just to show us that Jesus can take a blind person and make them see. Here's the key. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? 
Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Reba, would you come on up and play the piano a little bit? Key to the whole passage, verse 39, Jesus said, for judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. See, Jesus did not do this miracle just so that the blind man would see. He didn't even do it just to show us that he can make people see physically. Jesus did this miracle so everyone would see spiritually. That's why Jesus did it. He wasn't just restoring sight to one man. He was showing people what it means to see not physically, but to see spiritually. So what does it mean to see spiritually? Well, when you're blind, you're lost. You're confused. You don't know where to go. You don't know what's in front of you, to the side of you. You don't have direction. You don't have meaning. You don't have purpose, and so that makes you frustrated, makes you angry, because you don't know where you're supposed to go. But to see spiritually, if that's being spiritually blind, walking around life not knowing where to go, to see spiritually is to see that Jesus is the Messiah. To see spiritually is to see that Jesus is the Messiah. So what does that look like practically? John 14, verse 1 through 6, says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Jesus says, Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may also be be. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we do not know the way. We don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? If you find yourself lost today, confused today, frustrated today, this is what Jesus says to us. Verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me. Would you bow your heads with me? And we're going to reflect for about a minute. To see spiritually is to see Jesus as the Messiah. So what does that mean really practically for our lives? It means for him to be the way for me. The truth for me. The life for me. So in your life, is Jesus your way? Meaning, is Jesus the one who's directing your life? The way means, means to have a direction. It means to have a path. Jesus is the way. He wants to lead your life. If you find yourself confused about where you're supposed to be going, Jesus is the way. Are we letting him lead our lives? Are we are we leading our lives or are we letting him? Are we saying, God, I want this job. Will you give it to me? Are we saying, God, what job do you want me to have? Are we saying, God, I want this relationship. Will you give it to me? No, instead we need to say, God, what relationship do you want me to be in? Is Jesus our way? Second, is Jesus our truth? That means do we define what's true? What's right and wrong, or is Jesus deciding what's right and wrong in our lives? Are there some things in our life that if we ask Jesus, he would say, hey, son, daughter, I don't want you to be doing that. I don't want you to be going there. I don't want you to be experiencing that. But in our mind, we've started to try to just say, oh, it's, it's all right. But Jesus is the truth. And today, 
we have the opportunity to cast all those things before us feet and say, Jesus, you are my truth. Lastly, Jesus is our life. Because now it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Meaning Christianity isn't a religion, it's not an organization. Christianity is a relationship with God through faith in Jesus. Meaning, it's this deal that Jesus gave his life for us, and so we give our lives to him. I don't live for Nick anymore. I give my life to Jesus. And so as we enter prayer, is there any area of your life that today you need to say, Jesus, I give this back to you. Or this situation I'm experiencing, I need you to be my way. I need you to direct me. I want your will, not my will. Or you are the truth, Lord. I've, I've traded the truth for a lie in this area. I need to give this to you. God, I surrender. I repent to you. Or maybe you're here today and you say, Jesus, I've been trying to live my own life. But today I give you control. To all the Christians in the place, if, if that's you today, you just want to say it. Jesus, I've been withholding this one, this little thing from you, but I surrender it to you. I've already given you my life, but Jesus, I, I give you my life again. Lord, I just surrender this. Would you just slip a hand up so I know who I'm praying for? You just say, God, I just want to give you this peace. Lord, I'm not holding anything back. Hand up, hand up. Praise God, praise God, praise God. You say, God, I just want to give you that peace. I see that hand. Praise God. You're saying, God, I just want to give you my heart. Lord, I pray for all of us who just want to give you a little more of our heart. God, and we want to give you our plans. We want to give you our truth. We want to give you our life. God, we surrender to you. God, you can do so much more with our life than we ever could. And so, God, we put you as not just the Savior of our life, but the Lord of our life. And now, if any of you here today, you walked in and you don't have a relationship with God, maybe you grew up in a church that didn't even talk about a relationship with God. You just thought, hey, if I attend church... If I do this or I do that, that makes me right with God, right? The reality is, is that we are saved through faith in Jesus. That's it. By putting our faith in Jesus, not attending a church, not any religious act or ceremony, by putting our faith in Jesus, giving him our life, we become right with God and all sin is washed away. It's defeated. And today, if you're in here and you want to make that decision to put your faith in Jesus, to make him Lord of your life, with nobody looking around, nobody eyes closed, this is between you and your Savior, who right now is looking at you and saying, I love you. I died for you. If today you want to put your faith in him, would you slip up your hand? Anybody today, you say, Jesus, I trust you with my life. I see that hand. Praise God. Anybody else? Say, Jesus, today I want to give you my life. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? Today you want to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. Praise God. We have a few people putting their faith in Jesus, so there's nothing magical about this prayer right now. You are right before God. I just want to give you some words to the faith that you just made. So all Christians in this place, nobody prays alone. Would you repeat after me? Say, Jesus... I believe in you. You're the son of God. You lived a perfect life. You died for my sin. And you rose from the dead. Save me from my sin. Make me new. I give you my life. Now I live for you. Amen. Church, three people just put their faith in Jesus. Can we celebrate right now? The Bible says all of heaven is erupting in praise over one person. Come on, we can do better than that. All of heaven is praising God. Praise God. Praise God. If you made that decision today, even if you didn't raise your hand, you're not saved by raising a hand. You're saving by putting your faith in Jesus. If you did that today, the Bible says you are now washed clean. All of your past, present, and future sin is gone. And now you are made perfect before God. So now, because of what Jesus did for you, you can talk to God whenever you want. He's always with you. He'll never leave you. You just talk to him. You wake up in the morning and say, hey, God, how are, how are you today? You're probably good. Help me be good too. 
you have a relationship with God. And the Bible says that your next step, okay, we're not saved by any steps or by works, but he instructs us to take steps in our faith. The next step for you is baptism, water baptism. You're not saved or washed by the water. It is the outward sign of the inward change that you are now washed clean. And so he wants to illustrate what that looks like. So we baptize people who put their faith in Jesus. We don't baptize infants. Exciting though, next month we have a few child dedications. Parents who want to say, hey, I am raising my child in a Christian family who we're making sure they love God. It's coming up in a few weeks. But when people put their personal faith in Jesus, we baptize them as a symbol, an outward profession of their faith. And if that's you today, any time in your life, since you've put your faith in Jesus, you haven't been baptized, you should. That's what Jesus says to do. It could have been 10 years ago, but you've never been baptized as a symbol of your faith because nobody can believe for you. Lord knows your parents can't believe for you. Your grandma can't pray enough for you for you to believe. It's your decision with your Savior. And if you've done that, we would love to baptize you. All you need to do is fill out a connection card in the seat backs in front of you. On the back side, there's a box that says baptism. Check the box and write your name. Bring it to the welcome desk. And we would love, love, love to celebrate what God is doing in your life through baptism next month. So do that. All I had to say, was anybody blessed to be in church today? I have to tell you, I like vacation, but only so I can get back here and do what God has created me to do. But now as we prepare to leave, what has God created you to do this week? We say it around here, our purpose is to love God, love people, and help others love God. So what's God created you to do? Who can you pray for this week? Who can you invite next week? Who can you minister to? Who could you serve? Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your people that you love. I pray you would send them out of this place refreshed by your presence, God, that they would know that you have created them for a plan and a purpose, and that is this week. It's not distant or far off in the future. You are creating missionaries in five-year-olds right now. You are sending pastors to go out and minister now. You are sending businessmen and women to be your ambassadors in this city, in this county, in this state, in the world right now to go out and tell people about you. So God, I send them, I commission them to go out and do what you've called them to do this week. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? If any of you would like prayer, our prayer team is coming down now. We would love to pray for you. Otherwise, we are going to have lunch served right over here. Go find a seat at the table. Uh, the baked goods are served over here. All the proceeds for this whole thing just goes to send our 12 missions team members to Haiti this summer. So, if you're able to be generous, God bless you and be generous. If you just want lunch and you don't have any money, please have lunch anyways. You can also give online. You click on the giving button on our app. You can just designate in there what you want to give it to. But God bless you all this week. Head out to the lobby. If any of you would like prayer, come on forward and we'd love to pray for you. God bless you.